Hi, everyone. A very warm welcome to this session of Let Us Talk It webinars. We are extremely excited um, to start this new year with a new, um, uh, the webinars are same, but uh, with a new uh, approach of having the maximum time, uh, utilization of the time of all the speakers, all the uh, attendees who are joining in our webinars. So um, I'll talk to about that a little bit later, but for now, uh, just uh, trying to uh, welcome you all, who, all those who have joined in on uh, social media, on YouTube, uh, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, a very warm welcome. And uh, we have, for one hour, we have three webinars zipped in. So um, it's all technical. And if you have joined in, please uh, let your colleagues, family members, or uh, anyone who you know would be helped, uh, please let them join. Uh, send them the link. And it as, the, as we are trying to help the community to uh, make a more informed and enhanced community, you can also um, you know, join hands and do your bit as well. So with that, we begin our uh, Let Us Talk It webinar first. Uh, so we have three webinars or three topics that will be discussed in one day and one hour. Um, so the, our first topic would be, uh, uh, the cloud native versus uh, traditional applications of the future uh, for banking and financial services uh, sector. And our next topic would be overview of AI and machine learning. Learn the basics behind artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and neural network. And our a third uh, one would be digital transformation. Uh, re a configuring your organization to take full advantage of di digital innovation. So those are the three uh, topics of today. We give each speaker 20 minutes of time initially. And uh, so after this listening, you can give your feedback in our Let Us Talk It website and um, the speaker whose topic you uh, feel needs more elaboration, you get connected, uh, please do send us um, in that feedback or you can email us at webinar at letustalkit.com and let us know about your thoughts, your feedback, and we assure you we'll bring back that speaker, uh, that topic for you for full one hour in our next session. And uh, this is our pilot um, webinar for today. So uh, calling it Zipinar, giving it a new term, a uh, new thought, new um, uh, dream uh, for 2021. Hope it will work out. And um, having said that, we go for our first speaker, with us, we have Vinay Rajagopal, who brings in 17 plus years of experience in enabling partner ecosystem to adopt new age technologies, practices, and solutions to embrace digital transformation initiatives, modernize and optimize platform delivery. And a lot of technical terms, which I'm not going into, and I'll leave it to him to explain. But what I uh, love about his profile, and I'm sure you love it too, is that he holds three granted patents and two published files, Blackboard Certified Product Management Professional Management from London School of Economics and Political Science, Design Thinking from Emirati Emiritus, MIT, Exec Executive Education Strategy and Leadership from Jack Welch Management Institute, and engineering from VTU and is currently pursuing his master's in AI. That was a lot to even talk. I'm just uh, uh, wondering how he managed acquiring all those knowledge. And he is also a member of the Artificial Intelligence Work Group SCORE team at World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, a volunteer for community-driven development initiatives through Rotary Club, and a weekend author. That's about it. All uh, thank you so much, Vinay, for joining, being our first web uh, speaker for our webinar, and over to you. Thanks, Julian. I, I think that was a very kind, uh, very warm uh, welcome as well as uh, a brief introduction. 
Uh, I'm glad you pulled off <laughs> all the educational, academic, uh, you know, portions uh, that, that I had briefed out, which is which is very good. Thanks again. Uh, let me get started. I'll share my screen and just let me know if it's all fine. There you go. You guys see the screen okay? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Thanks a lot. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about how applications, uh, you know, are progressing. There's quite a, quite a lot of influx right now in terms of handling the legacy applications versus uh, what we call as born on the cloud, right? The cloud native applications. Uh, we'll also look at the industry overview and then a couple of open source initiatives that we're working on, which is something that you guys can, you know, kind of tap into. You could download those codes, play with it and see how you could embrace that into you know, some of your uh, organizational or your uh, you know, passion towards building code, building applications and so on and so forth. So on that note, uh, let me get started. Um, quick introduction, I think Jilan has, has already done a good job, uh, but just to you know, kindly quickly brief, uh, I'm responsible for the partner ecosystem with Red Hat, um, you know, from a solutions and architecture, from a technology perspective. I'm also a member of um, the AI work group uh, from uh, the World Economic Forum, which is a part of the Smart Cities mission. I'm also a member of the IET Future Tech panel, um, and, and she's already briefed. But one thing that I want to stress upon for everyone who's, who's watching this webinar, or Zupinar, I should say, uh, is there's no end for learning. And you heard Julan mention that I'm currently pursuing my master's in, in, in uh, AI. Uh, you know, there's definitely no end uh, in, uh, for learning. Um, and some of my patents, uh, you could go to my LinkedIn profile. It's linkedin.com slash IN slash Vinay Raja Kapal. Um, click on those links and you'll be able to read through the, the patents completely. Uh, that would be of some interest, hopefully, for you guys. Um, and having said that, uh, let me quickly set the context up, right, in terms of where is the industry heading. And it's absolutely important for you guys to you know, kind of envision that and see where were we a few years ago, where have you it'll be all this long way and where are we heading towards, right? And that, that's, that's the key emphasis in terms of how uh, technology has evolved, right? And, and, and if you look at it from a, from a banking perspective, um, we've seen typical banks, you know, the, the, the brick and mortar kind of a setup, right? For every little thing, you have to get into the branch, get your stuff uh, done, complete those transactions and then walk out, right? It's as simple as even drawing cash out of your own bank account. Now, we've seen that uh, has evolved into ATMs, it's evolved into um, what we called online banking. Of course, those days it was all web and eventually it's, it's, it's come to different form factors of what we call handles, right? The spot fields. And what happened in the last decade, if you've seen, um, you know, there's, there's been a very strong ecosystem that's built across the banking services, right? The, the API, the ability to expose data in the form of an application programmable interface gave way to a lot of, um, you know, fintechs, like we call it, all those uh, startups on, on, in, in, from a financial perspective. Uh, and not just that, if you, if you see in the last few years, uh, the API economy has truly opened up very large initiatives, like for example, the Europeans, um, it, it, you know, they came up with this all open banking initiative where there was very defined standards and the roles that each party would pay, uh, you know, play within the consortium to kind of expose the data and make sure the, the banking services are available for anything as, as, as simple as retail or a smart pay, even using your watch to make a payment and things like that. That kind of truly led... Uh, uh, in terms of embracing what we call a circular ecosystem, you know, all the partners, the business to business consumers, and then finally exposing it to the end, uh, end customer, right? So bank being process oriented, which is, which is what it has always been, even now for that matter, became more flexible, more customer centric. Uh, and the fact that there were several other services which was able to tap into what bank had to offer. Uh, and that led, like I said, to a lot of FinTech um, ecosystem and and remember as in when the the data got exposed um, again the European countries came up with this um, uh, regulatory emphasis in terms of protecting the data right it could be personal data it could be sensitive data and that's how it led to GDPR and of course 
the, the, the general data protection regulation that the European Union brought in uh, was also embraced um, for, you know, from various parts of the world. Uh, California was a state to follow that, right? With CCPA, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. And of course, um, India has just stapled uh, the, the India uh, Data Protection Bill as well. So that led to what we call RegTech, the regulatory, um, you know, technical, um, uh, startups that also fueled this ecosystem. Now, where where is where is all this heading? You know, this 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 whole payments, whole services. Now, if you see where where all of this is heading, uh, you, know, you know, from an industry perspective, is tomorrow you would see vehicles like your cars, which are connected, where they're instrumented, um, they're connected, and therefore they're intelligent. So the next time you walk into your fuel station. Mm -hmm. You 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 don't have to pull your wallet or or, or you know use your credit card to make a payment. Your car will be instrumented to an extent where it would then pay for for you know for your gas station wherever you're filling, right? So that's where we're heading. We call that V2X vehicle to anything. You know, every connected vehicle has a lot of data that could help the the the, the uh, you know the community, the county, um, the the municipal corporation in terms of understanding the traffic patterns in terms of even, you know, probably looking at a natural disaster, it could be a landslide or a storm or any of those uh, by the patterns of these connected cars. And, and how are bank, banks making a difference? You know, when it comes to the, the payment, like you know, we call that as wallet of on wheels, right? So your cars are gonna become virtual wallets for you to make payments. Now that's, that's on the upper side of the horizon, right? If you look at what is happening on, uh, you know, from a bottom line perspective is everything is getting hyper-personalized. And what that means to us is identity and access management will continue to be at the center of the, the, the every initiative that a bank or anybody in the financial sector has to deal with, right? And what is that is happening is there, there's a definition of a global consumer-driven identity and access management. And tomorrow you would see uh, you know, you would see your smartphones becoming so intelligent that you don't have to key a password. All you have to do is use your biometrics, um, you know, your facial detection and so on and so forth, and would still be able to, you know, transact with the bank seamlessly, uh, you know, with protocols like Fido, um, where, where, you know, organizations like Samsung is already uh, working on the betas to implement that on, on their smartphone. So you would see identity, you would see wallet on the wheels, everything embracing what we call the future of, of a bank, right? And if you see, um, if I have to take my own personal example, uh, during COVID, uh, you know, I, I, I had to apply for a, for a home loan, a mortgage, uh, and, and everything happened virtually, for, right from my application to the approvals, the sanction, and so on and so forth. Everything happened, you know, virtually. So that's where everything's heading. It's 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 evolved from being a product uh, position to customer centric to now what we call the things, the connected things. Um, now you call it neo banks, you call it virtual banks, you call it digital bank. End of the day bank as a service is, is potentially possible. Uh, so that's that's a quick overview in terms of, uh, you know, where is the industry heading? And, and for, for any industry or any digital transformation initiative, um, you know, it's, it's absolutely important for us to understand how are the systems of engagement, the applications, which are the heart of all these transactions are evolving, right? And if you see from being what, what was very siloed, in, in a monolithic architecture, which is a client server based architecture and very product centric, right? And this is how you have to do, this is how your workflow is, this is what the process that's tied to this application. That, those were the traditional aspects of the application, the way it's developed, the way it's packaged, the way it's deployed, right? And, and everything underneath the application, which is your infrastructure. Where is that heading? And we see a lot of new new age workloads, right? Which are uh, very dynamic in nature. It's driven through a partner ecosystem, the ability to tap into, uh, you know, niche players. Like for example, uh, you know, you have an application, you want to push a notification, you would probably go to Twilio or, or any of those SMS services that you don't have to really worry about 
how do I set up an SMS gateway? How do I send this notification onto a smartphone? But you would have services which have pulled their niche into that. They've, they've abstracted everything and given you just a couple of calls, a couple of uh, codes in your application. You could then you know, send a, a very customer-centric, uh, highly personalized notification to your customers. So that's, that's where we're heading in this infrastructure you know, can be on cloud, can be, which is like a public kind of a setup or can be on-prem, which is a private setup, but where are they, you know, kind of truly coming together as a hybrid scenario, right? But there are workloads that you want to ensure is protected and, and stays within your um, data centers and so on and so forth. And there are new age workloads that, that you're happy to, you know, kind of embrace um, the public cloud from, from a, a cost and uh, economic perspective, right? The total cost of ownership as, as such. Um, and what we're seeing is truly hybrid, truly dynamic and very ecosystem driven. That's that's where everything is, is heading, right? One that was architected for transaction, now their speed, agility and resilience that is required to ensure customer experience is, is at the center of everything that you would do. Um, now, having said that, we've seen cloud-driven technologies and processes uh, definitely improve efficiency, agility, and you go to market. Uh, and at the same time, if there, are, uh, you know, if there are too many customers, how do I scale? You know, can I scale vertically? Can I scale horizontally? All that potential are possible. We see seventy-one percent of CIOs CIO say that that is their topmost priority for their enterprises, right? And and you also know that there are legacy applications that you'll have to do with, right? And before before we get there. We, we, we also see that there's about 70% of organizations which are running, you know, three or more containerized applications in production by 2023. That's a huge thing. So there are people as a part of their digital transformation initiative are, are already adopting the containerized workload. But, but there's always this challenge of two worlds, right? There is innovation that ha is happening, uh, you know, from a cloud native applications, cloud native technology uh, perspective, which definitely gives you speed, gives you your CI, CD and DevOps pipeline, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment, very optimized, uh, gives you, you know, the left shift in terms of the code coverage. Uh, but you also understand there's a lot of traditional applications which still exist within your data center, right? Which is very tightly coupled to the architecture. Sometimes it, it uses some of the acceleration that is driven out of the hardware, um, which is again, very tightly coupled, right? Uh, quite slow, takes a lot of time in terms of building new features, making changes and, and so on and so forth. And it gets very difficult to, to build that visibility. And without visibility, you will not be able to maintain the desired state. What that means is you don't have much of a control on that, on that whole system of record and engagement, right? And that means you were not really qualifying the automation. And automation definitely leads uh, to, to uh, you know, unlocking the investment, the resources, and the time that's required for, for you and your organization to truly, you know, go towards something that, that's not repeatable, right? There's something that would then bring in, in, in an innovation culture within the organization. That, those are very, very key. And, and what that means for an organization is that application modernization and adoption of cloud native technologies are an imperative, you know, definitely, uh, COVID has is, is, is been one prime factor that has kind of, you know, accelerated this whole digital transformation uh, journey. Now, now, having said that, what are the vantage points for, for you and your organization? Now, you, um, you know, you, you need to be uniquely placed to orchestrate and tap into your partners, right? And I mentioned about fintechs, you know, right techs, and then we've seen a lot of insurance companies tapping into retail organization. If I'm selling, if I'm a retail organization or I'm an appliances organization or I'm, you know, I'm selling a TV or something, I could now add an insurance to the TV or I could, uh, you know, if there's a repair process, I could sell my, uh, what we call the annual maintenance and things like that attached, attached to that, right? And retail um, banks have also have enough data to kind of help uh, customers realize various ways of investments, various ways of, you know, either tapping into an IPO market or equity shares and so on and so forth. So there's potential possibility for you to orchestrate and there's a need of building a circular partner ecosystem. Uh, and you all will be best positioned to do that only when 
uh, you know, you have the ability in your uh, in your IT is is flexible enough to take that forward. Now, not just that, you have to maintain that relationship, right? And that's only possible when you kind of integrate the core capabilities of your offering as a bank plus the partner solutions, right? And that's where you're, you're driving new experiences for your customers. And today, I can log into my uh, banking application and book a, a flight ticket, even book a a movie uh, ticket, you know, I could go, go to the theater close by and experience uh, some of those. Of course, COVID has kind of mellowed down uh, those experiences. Um, now, not just that, if you see, what are those new age workloads, right? I didn't mention about a few at the beginning from an industry perspective, but I do see a lot of uh, conversational bots, what, the, the bots that I don't have to really call the, the customer care and get my you know queries answered. I could just you know, chat with the bot and get my answers all at the click and, you know, a few text messages exchanged with the, with the smartphone. So there's a need to be frictionless. There's a need to onboard customers seamlessly, be it your KYC, be it your wallets on the things, be it the customer-centric identity and access management that I spoke about. Uh, and, and, and we've seen tremendous growth from peer-to-peer -peer lending, right? Uh, smart payments and so on and so forth, uh, which is truly leading and giving banks a vantage point. Um, and and those, those, those are extremely important. You know, we're bringing in orchestration, we're personalizing it, we're giving new experiences, and all of that in, in driven out of cognitive AI, machine learning. I'm sure uh, Karan is, uh, would emphasize much more of, uh, of that in the subsequent uh, uh, webinar. Um, so, so how do I translate this into, uh, you know, from a, digital transformation perspective, we see about 96% of companies have already in one or the other way, in, in some of the other form, have started their digital transformation journey. There, there is a definite intent and initiative that's already been embarked. We've seen about 49% of CIOs report that their enterprises have already changed their business models, or at least they're in the process of changing. And, and once you understand the new business models, once you understand engaging customers and delivering tangible outcomes in, in the form of uh, customer value, you would then realize that it's you know, the, the digital technology and the whole total cost of um, ownership and the investment would actually turn out to be 10 times cheaper because you're truly uh, you know, helping your customers derive the true experience. And that kind of st stands out as a vantage point for the organization. Um, now, having said that, how is this whole thing coming together, right? How are organizations really becoming digital leaders and how banks especially, right? So where, where do we start? So if, you, if we have to break that up into uh, different ways, we call that the underlining infrastructure, which is where everything is all, uh, you know, hosted. Uh, and, and like I emphasized at the beginning, it's all hybrid, right? And applications which have been monolithic, which had you know, client server kind of architecture now breaking into microservices. So that each service is uh, independent unit by itself. And there's not much of dependencies between services so that they can all operate asynchronously and give you that scale, performance, speed, everything that you require. And from a processes perspective, we're, we're not looking at, uh, you know, where we're building a feature for six months and then we take to the market and realize it's not helping our customers. It has to be, uh, you know, very agile. It, it has to have a CI CD strategy, the continuous integration, continuous deployment strategy to truly build a cloud native DevOps cycle. And those, those are some of the very important key imperatives, which are definitely a top priorities for the banks and the organizations to kind of uh, embark on the, the digital transformation initiative and truly evolve as a digital leader. Now, I wanna quickly, and, and I understand the audiences would be interested in realizing how do I make this happen? You know, all, all good about webinars to know what, where the industry is heading, what everyone should be doing, but how do I really go about doing it? That's a very key important emphasis, right? So what I've done is I've kind of put together um, a very nice architecture that kind of gives you a recommended path. It also gives you a phase-wise approach. What do you do is you start with your web servers, your virtual machines, and so on, so on and so forth. And then you look at rationalizing them from an application perspective and see what is that you could modernize. Uh, and how do you start adopting containers as the next phase where then you truly become um, a cloud native organization, which could be hybrid on-prem or public cloud for that matter. And there are definitely a lot of tools, a lot of 
um, you know, open source emphasis that gives you not just ability to orchestrate a, a container image, you know, bring the self-healing capabilities and so on and so forth, but it also gives you ability to monitor the health of your application. It also gives you ability to meter that if you if you're you know putting together uh, an emphasis like a you know pay as you use or anything as a service kind of a setup. Um, now the best part is. Um, if you if you can, if you kind of follow Red Hat, you know, everything we do at Red Hat is open source. Uh, and what we've done is we've taken the Kubernetes platform and we've added a lot of adjacencies to it, and we made that into a world class enterprise Kubernetes platform, which is you know the number one right now in the market. Um, what that means to you guys is if you build it on OpenShift, you could then deploy it on IBM Cloud, you could deploy it on AWS, deploy it on Azure, OpenStack. Uh, or on your own systems, or even Google Cloud for that matter, even Alibaba um, Cloud. So that that's that's the beauty of it. So if you're starting something, you're a startup, or you 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 have plans to build an application, please get started on OpenShift, and that truly gives you this interoperability. Um, you know, from a cloud perspective, a true multi-cloud architecture that you could approach. So that's the quick um, architecture, um, and and what that means is you know definitely you know, getting away of the overhead in terms of managing different development platforms, different tool chains for the DevOps, uh, no need to build siloed product units, regional vendor tools, dependency, cost, the overall cost for you know, production, um, not, ju not just from a development perspective, also the costs that are involved from a deployment perspective, fast change requests, easy to build new features, easy to know the, the, the draw the visibility factor so that you could then employ control and automation. Um, and, and that's that's the best part of, uh, you know, kind of reducing the compl complexity uh, on, on choosing that foundation that you want to build upon. Um, and then of course, cost savings, right? That, that's the key for, for any organization. Now, if I have to translate that quickly in the form of new age workloads, we talk about internet of things, IOT, and quickly on AIM, um, you know, machine learning aspects. And, and of course, like I said, Karan would then, you know, kind of give you more overview uh, from an AI ML perspective. So we do realize that there's there's everything's connected right now in, in, in the world, right? So that everything is smart, instrumented, interconnected. They have data to share, something that we all can tap into and, and kind of bring those insights to improve the efficiency of operations or new business models that we can build. Now, from an end-to-end -end perspective, it is very important. It's not just those devices which are interconnected, like I said. It's not just about managing those devices and ensuring there's a connectivity, but it, you know, in terms of policies, in terms of um, you know, limiting what is that you could and what is that you could not, right? From enforcing policies and access and so on and so forth. It's also important for you to you know, kind of run that analytics at the edge. Uh, which is which is a need to be very low latency, right? Uh, if you look at 5G, the ultra low latency emphasis of 5G, that's possible. For example, if you if you let's you let's say you're driving a driverless car, and 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 if you apply brakes, you know you see an object right in front of you, and you you apply brakes. Imagine taking that data to the cloud, computing that data, processing that data, and then giving an instruction to apply the brakes. You know, by the time you apply the brakes, you probably would have hit the object in front of you. So it, 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 there's a need for you to build that compute layer, build that analytics, build that ma machine learning, even at the edge, right? And then take all that, which is not required at a real-time basis to, to the cloud. So, so it's just always important for you to not just look at device management con uh, and connectivity, but also your ability to process at the edge and apply those insights. Now. For, for for anybody for that matter from an IoT perspective, right? You could you know you could bank using your watch, your smartwatch, or whatever it is. There's a need for you to also to integrate with various other applications, like you know your MES, your CRM, and so on and so forth. Uh, therefore, there's also a need of business and application integration, and not to forget the data privacy, the data security, or the all the compliance that you know, our, our regulatory requirements, you're bound to ensure uh, compliance, you know, from, from the law of lands perspective, right? So if I can break that up from an architecture perspective, um, you, you have various devices that are instrumented, 
you have an edge that you kind of brings your gateway to bring that data and then push that into an integration hub. And then you do all the data slicing and, and data management, your extract, transform and load operations and make sure you capture that data into your application irrespective whether it's cloud native or traditional. And that modular end-to-end approach from uh, you know, machine learning perspective would be, uh, how do I bring the, build the machine learning model? How do I train it? How do I infer out of it? How do I bring that data? Now, before you do any of those things, there's need for you to kind of translate that uh, data, which is, you know, from different protocols, right? Every devices would have its own protocol. There's several protocols that you would use, but you, you need that pr uh, translation of the data. You need your ETL operations. You need to build your model and constantly train that model and then take that uh, inside out to, um, you know, to, 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 out to your application again. So if I could map that up from uh, an end-to-end -end IoT perspective, these are the functional blocks. And of course, we would we could do this in, in some other webinar. Um, but from an overview perspective, um, and from a Red Hat perspective, we have AMQ. Again, AMQ um, through your Kafka streams, or you could use typically use a broker kind of a setup, which is you know like a service boss uh, where you could you know publish or subscribe, and then we have a a fuse, uh, Red Hat fuse component, which helps you, you know, in terms of integration to any other enterprise application. We also have three scale API management, which is, um, you know, gives you ability to expose data through APIs. You can also limit the API. You can authorize API keys. You can, um, you know, kind of limit the number of API calls and so on and so forth. You could throttle all of that. Uh, and, and, and one more important piece that I'd like to emphasize is your uh, Red Hat Decision Manager. Now, there is a need for you to decouple the business logic from the codes. For example, if, uh, if, if you have something like a logic that is coded, right? You'll have to go to your code and change every time. But if I kind of decouple that and put it into a rules engine, I could typically change just the rules and then set up multiple rules so that the code can then you know, fall back onto a rules engine and then make that appropriate decision. What that means is it's flexible. It's easy for your business analyst to, you know, make any changes from, you know, from a decision making perspective. For example, if I have, if I'm a premium customer for the bank and I would, you know, there's special interest rate for me for my mortgage, then, you know, the moment I seek for an application or, or I submit my loan application, um, it automatically looks through the rules engine and just detects that I'm a wealth management premium customer and then automatically gives me a pre-approved, uh, you know, rate of interest. So all of this, again, is, is built on open, uh, you know, you could use OpenShift to build all of this. All of these are open source, um, you know, components. You could Google all of this, go to Red Hat, go, go to GitHub, Red Hat handles, download them and play, play with them, use them in building your own applications and so on and so forth. So to kind of summarize this, uh, could be a virtual I machine. Interrupt, uh, Vinay, I hate to do it, but we just uh, want, uh, like, <laughs> if you could wrap up. Uh, yeah, very quick. To, uh, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks for that quick intro. I was waiting for that, Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> I hate, I want to keep that not open, close, and people coming back and asking where is Vinay. So that's yeah. how you have to leave it. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. So so, so we're all good. Uh, we've got others lined up. It's great. I will quickly touch upon um, the Open Data Hub initiative. You could access that uh, through OpenDataHub.io. Uh, that's a toolkit that we've kind of put together all of the open source stuff that you can you know quickly adopt into your AI ML initiatives. I'm sure Karan's gonna uh, deep dive more into, into AI ML overview. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's it for us for now. Go go there and uh, truly help yourself to architect for disruption. Um, and some call for action quickly before I wrap that up. I've got links out here that you could go um, use all our interactive tutorials that you could try and, and, and play, get, get your hands on it. Um, and, and, and start building those applications of the future. And I'm, like I said, I'm also uh, responsible for the partner ecosystem. So if any of you guys are interested in knowing the partner program of Red Hat, drop me a note and I'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks, uh, Dula, over to you. Yeah, amazing presentation, when I, uh, uh, it was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rini. Have a good day, guys. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. So much. Much.
and uh, we'll definitely um, have you for a full one hour webinar. And uh, we would like to hear from you audience uh, attendees. If you have question, please put it in the chat. We can get it, um, uh, we can send it over to Vinay. Any particular uh, question that you have, but we have to uh, go to our next uh, speaker. And uh, our next uh, topic for uh, today is overview of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Learn the basics behind artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and neural network. And to uh, talk on this, we have a very young uh, speaker um, who is the lead engineer at Penny and founder of Tribotics. Uh, he also has uh, been a Google I.O. speaker, Google crowdsource speaker, uh, in 2019, all of this, Global Azure Bootcamp uh, speaker, a judge, mentor, and speaker at Utkal Hacks first ever hackathon at the Civil Silver City of Orissa. So uh, he has, uh, whatever he has, he has the, uh, the technical part of it. But what one thing that I uh, noticed after talking to him is he is super energetic and super um, excited always to learn new things. Uh, and uh, for you, our next speaker, Karan Shaw. Karan, if you would. Uh, yes. You're on. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Julan, thanks for this uh, warm welcome. Okay, so yeah, uh, let's start with the thing. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, Julani has already given my, my introduction, but I'll give a small introduction about myself. I'm a lead engineer at Penny.co. It's a Dubai-based company. And apart from that, I was, uh, uh, I've was i also worked with uh, uh, as a head of engineer in Reftop.ai. I was also the ex-CTO of uh, uh, Prographer. And I'm also the founder of Tribotics Innovations Private Limited. So from last five years, I, I have uh, totally worked on AI ML uh, uh, products. Uh, this products were some products was a fintech company, somewhere uh, rectech company, somewhere uh, edutech companies. So somewhere logistics related companies. So this uh, uh, this companies have worked and have explored that how they are integrating the AI and ML in order to uh, solve the real world problems. So what I will do in this session, uh, I'll give you uh, the overview the, of uh, AI and ML and deep neural networks and how practically different companies are using on uh, on their products and how they are getting benefit about it. So. Uh, so let's uh, start with this session. So these are uh, these are my teams. These are the few events which I've done previously. I was also the speaker of Google uh, Google I/O, uh, uh, Google CrowdSource. I have, uh, I'm also a public speaker. So I love to uh, share my knowledge with young people and who be, uh, the people who are uh, willing to learn new things. So yeah. So let's start. So. Uh, so previously, uh, so before starting, uh, I would like to give you a small intro on uh, uh, basically on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So artificial intelligence is an area of computer science that emphasizes on intelligence machine and how they behave and react like machine, human beings. So uh, people say, some people have misconception that what exactly the AI means. So AI is something you're making, uh, uh, you're making, uh, uh, by utilizing computer science, you're making uh, intelligent systems. So uh, then what is machine learning? So machine learning is an application of AI uh, that program uh, that uh, provide the program and ability to Hello. learn it by itself. Hello? Yeah. So, so the, yeah, so AI itself is a very big domain. Uh, it has many branches and sub branches of it. If you see here, uh, uh, so AI are, uh, uh, have uh, branches like machine learning, expert system, speech uh, recognition, vision uh, vision recognition, planning, robotics, a lot many areas are there. Under machine learning, we can see deep learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. So if you see natural language processing, under uh, natural lang uh, language processing, we have uh, text generation, question engineering, uh, and machine translation. A lot many things are there, like we use uh, uh, a voice recognition system that also comes under uh, natural language processing. We have expert system, we have uh, robotics, we have computer visions. So a lot many, uh, these are the sub branches of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. 
Okay, so uh, you can see that these are the few areas where uh, where we are uh, uh, we are uh, using machine learning in order to solve the problems, uh, like uh, in a Google uh, self-driving car, in a natural uh, natural language processing has been used with the Google uh, uh, Google uh, you know, Voice, and uh, uh, when you're doing an audio to uh, when you're transcribing that audios at that time we are using natural language processing in robotics we are using reinforcement learning. So that's all about the, this. So, <clears throat> so if you see here, uh, uh, so artificial intelligence uh, is uh, have many subsets. So you can see the machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subset of machine learn uh, machine learning. So this is the uh, uh, more, more deeper classification of uh, deep learning. Is, you can see here. So let's understand how this uh, uh, how this uh, this uh, techno uh, technological e evolutions happen. So if you see when we were uh, when we were standing in 1915, at that time the term AI ML uh, sorry this artificial uh, AI has been term, and at that time we we learned how to program how we can make a auto playing uh, 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 auto playing ch chess game and how we made how the bot can play a chess uh, chess game. And later on, we uh, we entered in 1980s. We entered the a a era of machine learning, where we learned how we can uh, do spam filtering, where we learned how we can do basic classifications. We learned how we can do fraud detections. Those kinds of things we learned. When we entered in 2010, uh, we entered in an era of deep learning. We started using deep neural network, and after that, we it made us very easy. To, cl to uh, classify any image, we learn. Uh, we started uh, exploring more on computer vision. We learned how we can classify the image, how we can stitch the image, a lot many things. In the uh, further slide, I will show you that how deep learning uh, is solving very very critical problems in regtech, biotech, or fintech companies. Okay. So yeah, so uh, the applications of machine learning, you uh, I think you already knows that virtual pers uh, personal assistant that is. Uh, uh, Google Assistant, uh, uh, Alexa. If you see social media services like face detection in social, uh, if you uh, if you upload any photo in uh, Facebook, you can see that photos got auto tag. Uh, it uh, it tags your friends by uh, by uh, by by default. So that is the feature of face detection, friend suggestion, news feeds, advertisement, and in the email you can see in the, your uh, in your uh, 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 Gmail you can see that uh, there is a spam filtering that does. Uh, so all your promotional mails go to uh, goes to your promotional section. All your all your spam mails goes to your spam uh, spam sections. So there also we are using machine learning. So even online customer supports after this COVID apps, uh, many companies for their customer support they are using a uh, chatbots or uh, uh, or a uh, humanoid related ch chatbots who can talk like humans. And even search engine optimize uh, search engine results also they they are also very good. They are using. Uh, uh, machine learning in order to uh, give the better search results and a lot many things okay so uh, if we go deep inside machine learning we have three main class uh, different uh, kinds of categories one is uh, supervised learning one is unsupervised learning and one is reinforcement learning so by the image you can understand that supervised learning is where you have a data uh, and where your your algorithms in uh, in order to feed data to your algorithms, you have to classify it, or where where you have to teach your uh, algorithm that okay, this is uh, the, this is the x data, and uh, putting this the x data, you will get this y data, like that. And from that x and y data, the system tries to learn the uh, and try to build the model. But in unsupervised learning, by the word you uh, by the word itself suggests that it's unsupervised. You just put your data, and your system will classify by itself. It will group it by itself. It will try to find the hidden pattern inside it that we are doing inside a new deep neural network. And reinforcement learning is something where uh, uh, it's not to, uh, it's taking the advantage of uh, uh, supervised and unsupervised learning techniques, and also they, it's taking a live feedback from the environment. And on the basis of that, uh, uh, it takes decision. Mainly, it is mainly it is used in self-driving car, in robotics. Because uh, because the, the the training which you have provided that uh, taking the advantage from that, but even the the, the images for which uh, the uh, the car is capturing and even the sensors data on the basis of that the car is taking decision whether I have to move forward 
or I have to stop and how much speed I have to, uh, uh, how much I have to do uh, uh, the speed up, I have to speed up the car. So those all these decisions is taken on the basis of their life feedback, what it, it gets from the environment. So that comes under reinforcement learning techniques. So yeah, so if you see here, so uh, under supervised learning techniques, we have uh, two classifications like classification techniques and regression techniques. Under regression, we have simple regression, multiple regression, li uh, linear and nonlinear regressions. And under su uh, supervised learning, we have clustering techniques and association techniques. And under semi-supervised learning, uh, it's a, uh, let me talk about the uh, semi-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning, is a learning, it's a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning techniques where your data, your some of the data are classified and they, ha they have proper labeled and some data are not having proper labeled data. So in that kind of situation, you're going to use unsupervised learning, uh, sorry, semi-supervised learning techniques. And re reinforcement learning, I've already told about that it takes the feedbacks from the life environment also. So uh, the, the feedback can be negative feedback and positive feedback also. Okay, so if you see this uh, tree, so you can understand here under supervised learning techniques, there are di many different algorithms to problem solve particular problem. If you see, if you're having something, if you have a data where the data which are, if you're having some data which are already labeled, so you can go with supervised learning techniques because you have your data are supervised, your data are labeled, it already knows the answers. So in that situation, we'll go with supervised learning techniques. Under supervised learning techniques, we have many different algorithms like uh, regression, decision tree, random forest, classifications. Under classification technique, we have K, uh, different algorithms like K, uh, K nearest neighbor, a logistic regression, Navier's bias, support vector machine. Under supervised learning techniques, uh, as I told, under uh, uh, unsupervised learning techniques as where you have only the data, so you don't have the label, and you want your system to detect the label by itself, or you want the system to group it by itself. So under that thing, we go with unsupervised learning techniques. So unsupervised learning techniques, uh, under unsupervised learning techniques, there is, uh, 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 there is cl clustering, there is association. And if we go with the reinforcement learning, so, uh, so if you see this, uh, that they are uh, yeah, supervised and unsupervised, they are further classified like ca continuous problem or categorical problems. So categorical problem where you can simple, uh, you can categorize it. Okay. And continuous problem where you can't, uh, ca cat uh, ca can't categorize it. So let me go further and uh, give you some uh, more deep examples. So, yeah, so you can see here. So under supervised learning, uh, we have, uh, classification and regression. So what, what areas we are solving? Using classification, you can solve fraud detection, you can do image classification, you can do email, uh, customer retention, you can do diagnosis. So under regression, you can do prediction, new and slice. You, under reinforcement learning, you can do uh, robotic navigation, skill acquisitions, learning tasks, AI games, they all come under reinforcement learning techniques. And if you see the unsupervised learning, so under that we have, uh, as I told, uh, the clustering and association. So using clustering, we can do customer segmentation, target marketing, recommended system. And under uh, 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 reduction, you can do uh, structuring, uh, structured discovery, feature detections, meaningful co compression, big data will visualizations. So these are the few things uh, uh, by uh, seeing this picture, you can understand that which which areas and which which domains the AI animals are solving. Okay, so uh, let's understand uh, more properly that what is supervised and unsupervised, maybe in the further previously, uh, you didn't get more better and uh, understanding by seeing this image, you can proper, uh, you can understand that uh, uh, you can understand here that uh, suppose I have labeled data, which I told in supervised learning, we have labeled data. So like we, we have the images of the bird, uh, birds and we have already labeled it like dark, non-dark. So when you train it, you train your model and you give a new bird image so it can predict whether it is dark or non-dark. This kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, class, this kind of algorithms we call, uh, this kind of techniques we call supervised learning techniques because here you have a uh, labeled data. But what if, if you don't have a label data? So if you don't have a label data, then we go with unsupervised learning techniques. So here you don't need any supervision. Your algorithms by itself, it will, uh, it will create some pattern on the basis of uh, structure, uh, colors, and lot many other things. And it will try to group it. It will try to, uh, uh, using clustering technique, it will try to group it on the basis of the various features. So here the system uh, uh, by itself take decisions. 
and reinforce uh, reinforcement learning I, i have already given you the example suppose if you take a robot and you want to uh, solve this uh, problem so uh, uh, when you are uh, so the robots what it does it takes a, a life feedback from the environment and by the basis of that it takes decision so so uh, let's go more deep inside machine learning as i told it's uh, the deep learning is a subset of uh, machine learning so what improvement we got after 2010 what improvement we got in deep learning so you, you can see here that in machine learning uh, so we uh, there were four steps involved like input then you have feature extraction then classification then you get the output but in deep learning what problem we solve using deep neural network the feature extraction and classification happen inside one method inside a one uh, uh, one step so this was one of uh, greatest uh, achievement because we did not need to always put some uh, uh, we uh, in this actually the deep learning if you have a huge amount of data so this neural network performs very good so in the further slides i'll show you that how that uh, it does so this is uh, the few practical example suppose you, you, you have uh, labeled your image that where is chair and where is furnitures where are swimming pools so after training on the neural uh, neural network you'll get you'll get the classified data like uh, by classifying that uh, okay in this image we have a uh, swimming pool in that in this image we have chairs furnitures like that so yeah so uh, let's understand what is uh, deep learning so but deep learning is uh, i have given a very simple example here uh, so we have a input we have to hidden layers and we have a output so in the uh, the, the magic actually uh, the magic actually happens inside your hidden layer so if you see more properly you can see here so uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a input layer and then we have two hidden layers so then in, in in the hidden layer you can see in each layers the uh, deep neural networks performs the the feature extraction you can see in the one layer it is extracting all the eyes nose and all the uh, different different features and then it does the face extraction and then it predicts the output so uh, what we do when you upload your photos uh, so your facebook by default it tags your friends so this is what the facebook does internally the it takes the photos it's uh, it extracts the features and by extracting the features it try to understand that with which image it is it is matching with which of your friend in your friend list it is matching and by that it tags the friends by default so i don't want to go inside more deep inside this because we have a very uh, less time so so uh, this one more thing i will talk about this uh, there is forward prop propagation and backward propagation in deep neural network uh, so if uh, if something if uh, machine is, uh, when we are training in the deep neural network if, uh, if the desired result doesn't come then it goes for backward propagation it corrects the uh, weightage and again uh, it does the uh, uh, does the same thing okay so yeah so this is one uh, 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 image by by seeing this uh, gif image you can understand how the whole things happens so you have a training data then you decide your ml algorithms on the basis of what kind of data you are having uh, you uh, do you want to do supervised learning or unsupervised learning or do you want to perform a, and what kind of algorithms you are going to use you are going to use kn networks or you are going to use support vector machine on the basis of your data so you will you are going to produce your models and then you have a new data then you feed your new data into your ml algorithms and then it going to predict some output and if if you are not getting desired output you can use reinforcement learning in order to retrain your models okay so now the application so the some of the practical uh, examples i am going to give you in this so so uh, in prographer when i i was working with prographers so there i worked with uh, uh, how we can uh, increase the how we can increase the uh, image quality how we can increase the if you, if suppose you are having a low resolution image how we can increase the image quality you can see here the frog image that, that is little bit blurred when you zoom it then after using a deep neural network we are able to produce this fine output so one more a practical example i'm going to give you here so you can see before and after you can see here so after doing a 4x zoom so the image got blurred so when we pass this image with our uh, by when we train our ai and ml algorithms uh, deep, uh, by using deep neural network uh, uh, and tensorflow we are able to produce this kind of output you can see that the image is so clear here one more example i will give you this example so you can see the before image 
so and after image in the after image you can see the sky is little it's more bluer you can see the uh, the the swimming pool is more bluer so what it does as i told we we train our deep neural network that if you find any skies then you make it little bit bluer if you find any trees or something like that so you make it more greener if you find swimming pool you make it more bluer so like that you can see that by using ai and ml we have produced a tremendous output here with the food also we uh, previously we were also working with swiggy uh, for, for food photography so this is what we uh, when you uh, when uh, we get a photos from our photographers so before the image and after we pass it this image to our uh, ai and ml algorithms we get this kind of output you can see the colors and all the colors are coming so clear they are so prominent uh, uh, looking so prominent prominent and tempting Okay, so this is also one example uh, I can show you here. So you can see uh, 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 before uh, uh, we have two image and we wanted to stitch it uh, together. So when we were using uh, when we uh, we were using simple machine learning algorithms, you can see the image has been stitched but it has not blended properly. But you, by using deep neural network, you can see the third example. You can see how well the image has blended. So this is well, this is the main advantage of deep learning where you get more prominent outputs okay so yep so that's all uh, these are few uh, references i think you you can take uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, yeah, okay. thank you yeah thank you so much karan and uh, yeah but now next time the only problem with this uh, super innovative and ai and uh, mi and everything <laughs> that you actually forget how things look um, uh, in its original form. So <laughs> that's the only issue here. So <laughs> better. Mm, uh, yeah, but it was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for keeping it, uh, uh, you know, uh, best uh, the time that was given to you. And uh, yes, anyone, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. We'll try to take it. Um, you know, uh, if we can, if we have some time, or uh, we'll definitely, as I said, for Vinay as well, that uh, we'll have him, um, you know, uh, as the feedback we get, we'll have him definitely for a uh, one hour uh, session as well. So thank you, Karan. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, now we have our uh, third speaker. Um, he is um, Ashish, Ashish Gupta, and uh, he... Um, uh, we'll be talking about uh, digital transformation, reconfiguring your organization to take full advantage of digital innovation. So, um, yeah, can we have Ashish, uh, if you can have your video on and your, uh, if you can share your screen as well. Sure. Just give me a second. Yeah, sure. And um, while Ashish is doing that, I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, he is a digital expert with over 18 years of experience working with mostly ITSP like Accenture, HCL, and Wipro to name uh, a few. And currently he's working um, with uh, McKinsey. His expertise is to automate everything that is automatable, leveraging his expertise on AI, DevOps, RPA, blockchain, et cetera. So um, we look forward to what you have in store for us and um, absolutely honored to have you. Over to you, Ashish. Hey, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for calling me for this and then giving me an opportunity to talk. So guys, uh, I wanted to keep it very simple for you because I feel that, you know, the takeaways from my session should be the ones, uh, you know, which you can really use. And then whenever you come across something, you should be able to correlate to what you have seen here. So a short introduction about myself. Uh, I think uh, you have already covered it. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about what is the digital transformation and uh, what exactly it means for us. And uh, whenever you come across anything in digital, then possibly you might want to kind of look through this and then at least try to correlate it, it what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, typically, you know, in the world where we live in right now, 
uh, there are two kind of broadly two kind of companies the companies which are born digital right and and i think i don't have to name organizations like you know your triple a your amazon alphabet uh, apple to name a few and of course you know the companies and the organizations which were not born digital right uh, and then they were have their own traditional business model to work on so this discussion is typically for the organizations which were not born digital and when we talk about digital what exactly a digital means so when we talk about digital digital if you can remember it in a very easy way uh, as you can also see into the slides that the business model is what differentiate a digital and non digital organization and in order to support that business model the internal capabilities which are ensuring that a digital model is delivering the value is what can make a business digital and of course the last but not the least the customer experience for today's discussion we're going to only focus on the first two which is the business model and internal capabilities and i wanted to kind of uh, give you a vivid picture of what it looks like so from the perspective of business model gartner has very beautifully defined that the digital business development path looks in the following way as we all know right before the advent of web the business was pretty analog in nature there were only people who were there into the cycle people were almost based on the relationship mode and then the technologies that were typically used was you know erp and crm and then right after there was this before the nexus of forces now nexus of forces refers to the era where you know you have your social your mobile your cloud and your information right uh, current talked about ai uh so during the period when we were web when there was internet and then before the before the adoption of mobile social and cloud whatever i spoke about there were three more models that were evolved one was of course web and then the e business and the digital marketing so typically the there was there were a couple of more entities that got engaged in one of course you know business was there and then the people started interacting with the business and you can imagine that you know possibly uh, any organizations their focus was basically to move on to the new market uh, by virtue of uh, moving on to their new business into new geographies uh, they were extending their relationships and then they were doing it by adopting a couple of technologies and now right after the the era of change that we are in right now is the fluid change and and this is exactly what a digital business is imagine that you know your car needs a service so what we typically do nowadays right we kind of call up our uh, car service providers and then somebody at the rear end will look into okay you know now your car needs to get service and then he will book a an appointment and then possibly tell you that when you needed to come and drop your car for it to get service this is basically the analog web or the e business part of the world but when we are into a digital business or the kind of model that we can into be then possibly your car itself take up a decision uh, that you know it has to get serviced by virtue of using iot inside the car and then possibly the notification goes back to the uh, car provider and then the database gets uh, looked into and by virtue of the fully refined ai ml model a car appointment is being booked and then your you get a message on your mobile that you needed to drop the car at a specific date for that to get serviced so this is where the interaction is not happening only between uh you know business uh, but in fact there is another thing called as iot which comes into the picture and the things are becoming more autonomous right so that is where the business model becomes a digital model right where the interaction is between people business and things 
and and this is exactly the future looks like and i'm sure example of tesla is not unknown and a lot of you would know about it is is what is the new business model that we are adapting towards uh, gartner states that there are almost 75% of the uh, organizations which have fully adopted digital business model and there are almost a large number of amongst the remaining 25% which are either into the e business state that means they are still catching up on the global channels trying to become more effective and some of them are still lying into the web which means they still are having just a website to proceed further and hence they are they are working on enhancing their business model so this i would say help us to identify where is the business that you are currently into right now uh, is at this point of time looking into the picture that you see right now and then possibly decide that what can be the next state for me so that then i can become more digital or more autonomous and and this is exactly the future of a business looks like i'll keep moving if there are any questions please feel free to stop me or to just just write a message in the chat now as we said right that nothing is possible to become a digital business business until unless you have the capabilities to support it now this is pretty interesting if you are talking about the internal capabilities let me just try and see if i can hide this yeah if you talk about the internal capabilities the biggest hurdle uh, is you can always bring in a good technology right you can have ai ml model you can have uh, a lot of tools and applications to make sure that your business become digital but until unless your internal capabilities are not aligned then the whole uh, benefit that you can reap while becoming a digital business would not be there but then the bigger problem the bigger challenges which most of the organizations which were not born digital are facing is to bring that change and here is some of the studies that i did in terms of how we can make it happen so typically the organizations which were not really born digital they cannot become a digital organization until and unless they kind of create within their own organization a new company within the core company so this is the rule number 1 you do not have to kind of start with your entire organization going digital but basically a subset within your organization maybe you can call it as a new company within your core company which exactly would then take up the flag to become more digital the second rule of this to uh, create your internal capabilities which can become more aligned to uh, making your organization more digital is follow these three steps forgetting borrowing and learning and i'll i'll explain it in a second that what exactly it means that when you already have a or when you already have a new company within your own company you needed to ensure that you have a different governance and a different set of people who are taking care of the decisions for the new company for example in most of the uh, older organizations there is a specific way to take a decision there is a, a specific way to think through we always create a process and then that process gets followed throughout decades but then in the new organization we need to ensure that we learn fast we are more data driven we take fast decision and we ensure that whatever forecasted decision that we are taking and then we understand the result that it has given us so this is the kind of learning angle that you needed to bring in as i said we need to forget about some of those very old rules that are there into the company because once you are into digital place then you have to think and look through your organization as more of a data driven organization than just working on the rules the last and not the least is where you need to borrow that there are still some values which you need to borrow from your old organization to make sure that you know uh, you are able to uh, bring in some commonalities and still able to learn from the experience from the older organization to to uh, kind of make it more digital so once we are able to align the learn forget and borrow framework then the capabilities for the new organizations become much more solid and much more aligned towards the vision of you or your business becoming digital and and i have seen that mostly the organizations which were not born digital 
and adapting these kind of practices, they find their organization become digital much faster than otherwise. So I guess this, I mean, I, I don't have a too much of agenda to talk about it today. I just wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts that one is that how do you align your business model? And second is how can you really look through building your internal capabilities to make it more digital? I'll take a quick pause to see if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashish, um, for that quick uh, and uh, informative session. Uh, and uh, yes, you uh, did uh, cover it uh, right on time. But uh, um, I mean, we still have with us uh, Vinay uh, Karan and uh, Ashish, as you see. So um, I would, if anyone of you have any particular question and uh, you guys have that extra time, um, we can ask that question if it is okay. Yeah, great sessions. Thank you so much, everybody. It was nice to get a lot of um, you know good information uh, overload in one hour. Thanks, Rini. Yeah, you can feel free to unmute yourself if they, if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, probably we can conclude. Okay. So uh, if we do not have any question, uh, we would again uh, just uh, let everyone know that uh, we have we will be having these webinars. Um, it was previously three days a week. Now we are putting it together, uh, zipping it up, um, zipping the webinars. But definitely, whoever wants, uh, you know, as uh, soon as one webinar is chosen, we have the feedbacks. So we'll have the speaker back for one hour session. And uh, uh, with that, we just, if you have any question, any con uh, feedback, please do share it with our, uh, our uh, email us at webinar at let us talk it dot com. And uh, we do our uh, Let Us Talk It youth webinars as well, which uh, we do every uh, alternate Fridays for a younger group from uh, six years to 11 years. And for the older group from 11, 12 to um, uh, older group. And those webinars are uh, the older youth webinars. We have it every Saturday from uh, 4 to 5 p.m. EST. And uh, for those youth webinars, we have the prep session, which happens every Tuesday and Thursday. And they, they are the timings, the how it works. If you are interested, again, I would suggest you can email us at webinar at uh, letustalkit.com and you will get all the information. Thank you so much for joining in, inspiring us, and we are hoping that we can inspire the community in our small way possible. Thank you each one of you. Thank you all the speakers for joining in. Thank you attendees. And thank you all those who have joined in on social media as well. Thank you everyone. Have a great day and have a great thank night. You. Thank, thank you. you. Nice. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.